On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Falcon Heavy makes a picture-perfect launch and landing, while testing continues on Starship, NASA starts designing the next James Webb Space Telescope, and Roscosmos reveals the cause of the Soyuz leak on the ISS. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. The Falcon Heavy never fails to impress, and the U.S. Space Force mission launch on Sunday the 15th was no exception. SpaceX was contracted to put two payloads into orbit for the Space Force, one in the CBAS-2, which is some sort of communications relay that we've been told very little about. The other is the last part of a three-mission ring of satellites called Rooster, the Rapid On-Orbit Space Technology Evaluation Ring. The Space Force has said that the payloads are part of a prototype survey system that scans the local area of space and reports back to the ground if it spots any potentially dangerous change in debris patterns or object movements. The two systems are the latest in a new wave of US Space Force missions that SpaceX has been delivering to orbit, and they mostly involve the sorts of missions where we don't get a lot of the details, if we know anything about the payloads at all. Aside from that, the January 15th launch is the fifth successful Falcon Heavy operation to date, and it did not disappoint. Just look at the footage, it speaks for itself. Electrifying displays like that are what make us excited for the future, which was coincidentally being shown off at Starbase while the Falcon Heavy was putting in some work at geostationary orbit. Earlier last week, the Booster 7 and Starship 24 were stacked on Boca Chica's newly repaired and tested orbital launch mount. We even got some good shots of the testing area by European aerospace giant Airbus as one of their Pleiades NEO satellites passed overhead. Booster 7 was sporting some newly strengthened engine cowling, and the pair of vehicles had a couple of new external venting pipes that looked like they might be there to help bleed off excess gas buildup between the rocket stages. The roads were closed just before they started, and while some folks got a little ahead of themselves thinking this might be the first signs of a potential launch, this was just a fit test to see if the OLM and the newly fortified Booster 7 could take the weight. Not that we're not close to some big testing milestones, though. In a tweet on January 12th, the SpaceX team confirmed that these two vehicles are going to be going through some stringent testing over the weeks ahead, specifically making mention of a full-stack wet dress rehearsal and the long-awaited 33-engine static fire of Booster 7. So, while this stack may not have been a sign of a sneaky attempt at a first flight, it is a sign that big things are coming. And if SpaceX has shown us anything by now, it's that they never do anything small. Just a little over a year into the James Webb Space Telescope's mission, and NASA is already designing their next two big telescopes. In November 2021, the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine released their Decadal Survey, a document the industry leaders put together every 10 years that attempts to lay out the focus of study for the next decade. 2021's document highlighted, among other things, the need to study black holes and neutron stars in an attempt to learn about the beginnings of the universe and the need to search for life. The first requirement will be met by the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, formerly the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. This impressive piece of hardware will be equipped with a 2.4 meter wide mirror and a 300 megapixel camera, offering an image capture area 100 times larger than the Hubble can produce with identical resolution. But while the Nancy Grace Telescope will be probing the mysteries of gravitational phenomena, it's NASA's second priority that has people talking since a recent presentation shed more light on the mission on January 9th. It is currently called the Habitable Worlds Observatory, and its goal is to research for habitable exoplanets and scan them for signs of life. NASA has discovered about 13 planets in other solar systems since 2020, and even though we are confident that some of those are likely habitable, we don't really know. That's what the Habitable Worlds Observatory is supposed to fix. The current design plan is to create a super-stable telescope which will sit out at the L2 Earth-Sun Lagrange point, the same sun-blocking position the James Webb uses. It will also use a James Webb-style segmented mirror and a coronagraph, 
which is an instrument designed to observe a star's outer layers by blocking out their bright cores. This will help observers filter out some of the solar noise that obscures some of these exoplanets and should allow for a much more detailed view. But Mark Clampin, director of NASA's Astrophysics Division, says there's more to this mission than just a single new telescope. He says, quote, even though you may at first blush look at it and say, well, this is an exoplanet mission, it's not. It's an observatory. What Clampin is alluding to here is the idea that the Habitable Worlds Observatory is meant to be just that, a linked network of observation platforms using an array of equipment in order to make detailed surveys of any subject they are pointed at. Two more satellites are planned to join the first after a potential mid-2020s launch. They're both designed to add new, as yet undeveloped, infrared and x-ray technologies, and all of this will be built with commercial servicing in mind. Clampin again explains, in 10-15 years, there are going to be a lot of companies that can do very straightforward robotic servicing at L2. It means we don't necessarily have to hit all of the science goals the first time. A lot of big projects are being built over the next two decades, and making a new powerful life-finding orbiting observatory during a time when humanity will be the most active in cislunar space just makes sense. They shouldn't have any shortage of technicians. After weeks of investigation and experimentation, Roscosmos and NASA have released their explanation for the cause of the December 14th coolant leak of Soyuz pod MS-22. On January 11th, NASA and Roscosmos officials held a press conference where they detailed their long-distance detective work on the damaged Soyuz capsule attached to the International Space Station, as well as the theories they now hold about the cause of the leak as a result of the investigation. NASA and Roscosmos technicians on the ground used the station's cameras and the Canada Arm to gather as much visual evidence as possible. This is what initially found the hole in a radiator coolant pipe that confirmed to the ground team that the Soyuz hadn't simply malfunctioned, it had been struck. But with the status of MS-22 still unknown, it was safer to inspect it with the equipment. So from the images, the ground teams made some calculations and experiments to try and figure out if this was a strike from orbiting debris or something a little further out. Knowing the size of the hole, Russian engineers set up a test using a high velocity gun and an aluminum plate to simulate the Soyuz radiator pipe. The test results matched up with the team's calculations and the images of the damage giving grounds for a solid theory. Currently, the team has concluded that the damage is consistent with a small particle about one millimeter in diameter and a velocity of about seven kilometers per second. Sergei Krigalev, executive director of human spaceflight programs at Roscosmos explains further saying, we think that this is a meteoroid and not a piece of space junk because some other object on this orbit cannot exist. Because it has such a high velocity, it wouldn't stay on this orbit. That's why we think it's some kind of meteorite coming from a random direction. Micrometeoroid impacts happen all the time. This one just happened to hit an important spot at the right speed. It's hard enough to track orbital debris, but tracking something like what likely hit Soyuz MS-22 is pretty much impossible. So for now, the micrometeor theory will have to do, at least until they get MS-22 back to Russia for a physical inspection. And speaking of that, during the meeting, NASA and Roscosmos also detailed how they were going to be getting the current crew and the damaged Soyuz back home. The three-person crew of cosmonauts and NASA astronauts arrived to take command of the ISS in September 2022 and were due to use the Soyuz MS-22 capsule to return home this March when the next crew reached the station. Unfortunately, the damage to MS-22 means that the cooling system that keeps the crew from getting overheated during re-entry won't be active. It's apparently not likely the capsule will explode on the way down or anything, but engineers describe the interior of the small human Soyuz could reach over 40 degrees Celsius, not an environment anyone would like to be stuck in for very long. So instead, they've decided to bump up the next Soyuz launch, MS-23, to late February instead of the March 16th date it was originally scheduled for. This is when the crew swap was going to happen, and even though MS-23 will be ready to launch by then, the replacement crew will have to stay on the ground so the current group have access to a lifeboat and a way back home. 
That trip home will have to be in September now, which means extending the current crew's mission by another six months. That's going to make their mission a total of about 12 months, and even though they've been cleared by medical teams to stay that long, it's still quite a bit of time to be in microgravity. It certainly wouldn't be the longest time spent in space. That honor goes to cosmonaut Valery Polyakov, but you don't have to spend Valery's 438 days in space to start feeling the negative effects. Over the course of our time in space, things like loss of bone density, atrophy of muscles, and cardiovascular problems have all been measured in people who have spent months in space. But no one has ever been severely injured this way, and it's not like the crew has a choice. Soyuz MS-22 will separate and land uncrewed at the Roscosmos usual landing spot in Kazakhstan sometime in late March. After MS-23 makes a similarly automated approach and docking maneuver on February 20th. Until then, MS-22 is still functional. Its thrusters can help move the station away from larger debris, an event that happens relatively often these days, and should the worst happen, the crew can risk using MS-22 as a lifeboat. The current plan for that scenario has one or two of the three Soyuz crew members hitching a ride in the Dragon's Endurance cargo area with the astronauts of the Crew-5 mission. That might ease the thermal burden in the Soyuz. It's risky, but it's the best they can do right now. Shifting the timetables for the next two Soyuz launches has risks of its own, and for now, the crew of the ISS are doing just fine. And honestly, considering how random this event appears to have been, it's pretty impressive how well the multinational team has worked together to solve this issue. Regardless of whatever might be going on between the two countries down here on Earth, the mission technicians are, above all else, world-class professionals. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.